Hi, welcome to Make Your Own Jump Rings. I'm Lisa Claxton. Today we're going to learn how to make jump rings, both just a few by using cutters or making a large quantity using a saw. Jump rings are great for projects that include chain mail, making your own chain, adding clasps onto necklaces, or connecting wire wrapped links. I hope you enjoy today's lesson. These are the tools we'll be using in today's project. We have painter's tape. We have an adjustable jeweler saw frame. It's adjustable so that you can make it slightly longer or shorter so it will custom fit your blades. We're also using size one or size two jewelry blades. I have a bench pin along with a clamp. This will aid me in sawing my jump rings. I have my selected wire. You can use any desired gauge or metal. And finally, I have my jewelry flush cutters. What's important here is that my cutters be completely flush. The way you can tell that your cutters are flush is if you look closely at the back side of the blades, they should be completely flat. This will give me a straight edge on my jump rings when cutting. We'll also be using a selection of mandrels. Mandrels can be pretty much anything that's consistent in size. So you'll see here I have several different kinds. I have a metallic rod. This one's pretty small. I also have some lucite rods. Here I have some more steel rods. And these go up in size to larger sizes. But in a pinch, you can always make your own mandrels using household items such as Sharpies or pens. The lids to fingernail polish will work. Anything that'll give you a nice hard surface that you can wrap your wire around. Before we get started, we should talk a little bit about jump ring sizes. This is a very confusing area for jump rings. Oftentimes, stores and catalogs and other sources all sell their jump rings with different measurements. Our biggest concern is what is the inside diameter of a jump ring and what is the outside diameter of a jump ring. Most often, I find that bead stores sell their jump rings by the outside diameter. However, we're more concerned when we're working with chain mail that our inside diameter is a specific measurement. The inside diameter of our jump rings is measured by our mandrel. So for instance, the mandrel that I use in this lesson is about a five millimeter mandrel. So I know that the inside diameter is five millimeters. The outside diameter is measured by the size of my mandrel as well as the size of the wire going around my mandrel. One of the biggest problems that we have in getting these measurements is that we're using two different systems of measurement. For instance, we're using millimeters, which are metric, and we're using American standard measurements for our gauges of wire. For best results, you really should go online and check out the many sources that are out there that explain the difference of aspect ratio that's inside diameter versus outside diameter of jump rings. And oftentimes you can find charts that give you specific measurements to how many millimeters a 20 gauge wire is versus a 16 gauge wire. And this can help you in doing your math and understanding the formulas that will give you your exact jump ring measurements. So I'm now ready to begin my first project of jump ring making. I'm going to do simple jump rings that are cut with a wire cutter. So I have my chosen mandrel. I'm just going to use a steel rod here. And I'll be using 16 gauge copper wire. This is a dead soft wire. So to begin, I'm going to cross the wire over the mandrel and you'll notice I'm leaving myself just a little bit of wire here so I can hold on. 
I'm now going to begin wrapping the wire around the mandrel. Now, in the beginning, oftentimes my first couple rings might be a little bit loose, and I'm not worried about that. I can always tighten them up. And this is a heavy gauge, so it's easiest if I just push the wire onto the mandrel. And I'm really trying to get my coils nice and tight so that they each touch and they're right on the thickness of the mandrel. So I'm going to continue wrapping my wire around. until I have the desired number of rings that I want to make. Once I've wrapped on the length of my wire, I can now just tighten up my ends. Now this is a pretty heavy gauge wire, and so I'm not going to want to get my fingers right on the very tip. So because it's copper wire, I'm not worried about the waste. So I can always just cut off that wire there. I'm going to remove the mandrel. The benefit to using a hard plastic or metal mandrel is that when it comes time to remove, you'll notice my mandrel is sliding smoothly. If you use a wooden dowel or any kind of mandrel that has a soft surface, oftentimes with a heavy gauge wire it will bite down into the surface of the mandrel and when you try to pull it out, it won't come free and you tend to have to twist it out. So I always like to work with these hard surfaces so it just slips out easily. So now we're going to spread out the coil that we've just made. And I just use my fingertips here. I'm going to kind of grab in to these very last coils that I made. And we're going to use a little bit of force to spread it out. Now the space in between my coils needs to be big enough that I can get the tip of my wire cutters in. And I'm trying my best not to distort the rings. We're now ready to cut free our jump rings. What's important here is that every time I cut a ring, I always use the flush side of my wire cutters. And the way that I best remember, which is the flush side, is I always think of flush as the flat. So this is the back side of my cutter, where I'll notice there's kind of a diagonal on the inside. I'm always going to focus the flat side of my cutter towards the end of the jump ring, so the wire that I'm going to keep. I'm going to begin cutting my jump rings free by making a flush cut. And you'll notice I'm cutting off part of the wire that didn't go around the mandrel. So that's my first cut. And I want to make sure it's nice and flat. Now for my next cut, I'm going to visually follow the wire around to the point where it looks like if the two ends met up, it would give me a solid ring. I'm now going to flip my pliers over, so every time I cut, I'm having to turn my plier so that I have the flush end of the cutters facing the wire I'm going to keep, so the jump ring I'm cutting free right now. And I'm going to cut. So this gives me my first jump ring. I'm going to continue, and now that I've cut this end, you'll notice that there's a diagonal cut on the end of the wire, so it kind of comes to a point and it's very sharp. I need to cut that off, so to do that, I'm going to take my pliers and start the end of my wire with a flush cut, so I have the flat side of my cutter facing the wire coil, and I'm just going to trim off the very end. So I now have a flush end, 
and I'm going to repeat the process. I've turned my pliers over. I'm going to position them in the coil, visualizing exactly where I think the two ends should meet, and I'm going to cut. That gives me my next jump ring. I'm going to continue in the same manner through the entire coil, cutting off the end, visualizing where I think the two sides should meet, and cutting my ring free. Remembering each time that I need to cut first the beginning end of the ring, nice and flush, and then turning my pliers to cut the second side. Cutting with wire cutters is a great technique for when you just need a few rings to finish up a project. If I was working on a project that required lots of rings with consistent sizing, this wouldn't necessarily be the best technique to use. The main reason is the size of our rings, although we have wrapped them all on the same mandrel, the size adjusts according to our eye. Every time I cut, I try to cut so that the rings come perfectly end to end, but it's very rare that I could do a large quantity of these and have them meet up perfectly every time. If I cut my ring so that one side is just slightly larger than the other side, then when I close my ring tight, it will increase the inside diameter of my ring. If I cut it just a little bit shy of the length that I need, when I go to close them, the inside diameter will be made just a little bit smaller. Hi, Kate Richberg here, and I'm going to teach you how to saw some jump rings using the jeweler saw. So to begin, with this step, like Lisa told you earlier in class, she uses metal mandrels to wind her coil when she cuts her jump rings with a flush cutter. But cutting with a jeweler saw is a little bit different. We actually do want to use a wooden dowel for this step. So for sizing the jump rings, remember how Lisa told you that we are concerned with the inner diameter of the jump ring size. So whatever inner diameter you want your jump rings to be, that's the size of dowel that you need to get. So this dowel is a 5 16th inch dowel, but if I come here with my, um, my millimeter gauge, I can check and see that this is actually going to give me an inner diameter of six millimeters. So this 5 16 wooden mandrel is going to give me that six millimeter inside diameter jump ring. So I'm going to also use 16 gauge wire. I have about a foot cut here, but you can use any size you want. Um, I just chose 16 because I like nice heavy jump rings. So to start, you're going to get your dowel, and I cut about a six inch dowel here. Uh, it's about six inches or so. And I drilled a little hole with my drill uh, just about a quarter inch from the edge of this dowel. Now you want to make sure that the drill bit that you use is going to fit your wire and the wire doesn't need to fit particularly tightly in this hole. Now this is the trick kids. I'm going to push my wire around to start wrapping. Now I want it to be nice and tight and can you see how I'm bringing that around and around and see how I'm using my thumb to guide that wire into place. This is another critical step when you're trying to make a coil to saw into jump rings. Those coils that you're making need to sit one coil next to the other. So just to review, your coil needs to be tight and it needs to be close together. Okay, before we actually saw these jump rings, we're going to prepare this mandrel now that I've wound all of my little rings here. And what I need to do is I need to free up this coil a little bit. So I'm going to start by using my flush cutter. In this case, it's a heavy duty flush cutter, the Zeron Maxi Flush. And I'm going to come in and I'm going to go ahead and clip that end away and take it out of the little hole. 
and push this coil down towards the other end. Then I'll go ahead and clip that other end away. All right, so here we have the bench pin set up, and what I did was I clamped this pin to the edge of my work table, and I'm just gonna set my little coil there because we'll visit it in a second. And here is my saw frame. Now, the saw frame doesn't come with the blade in it. You have to insert the saw blade, and I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about how to do that now. Now, the saw blade, is really small as you can see and it has teeth on one side and really fine teeth and so you want to make sure when you are inserting this blade into the saw that the teeth are pointing out away from the saw and down towards the handle so remember out and down I do that because you know I can't really see where these little teeth are because they're so teeny I go ahead and use my finger and lightly brush it down the saw blade. I can feel that this side has the teeth and the teeth are kind of smooth. If I go the opposite direction really lightly, I can feel those teeth kind of catch on my finger. So I know that the pointy side, if it's going this way, it's the wrong way but if I feel it here, it's nice and smooth. The teeth are going out and down. So let's insert it into our saw frame. The saw frame comes with a couple of little thumb screws here. So I'm gonna go ahead and lean my saw right up against my table edge. And your saw blade doesn't have teeth on the top of the blade or the bottom of the blade. So I'm gonna insert that top part of the blade, first opening that thumb screw, inserting the blade and tightening it up, and nice and tight. And you want to make sure that the saw blade is coming out straight like this, straight up and down, not at a diagonal. And I'm just going to tighten it, tighten it like you mean it, nice and tight. Now, if I need to adjust my saw frame, I can do that here, but what I do is I want to adjust it, slide this baby down, and you can see that seems to be a little too long because I only want to grab the saw blade maybe a little more than halfway down in that clamp. So I'm going to just slide this up, tighten up this side, tight, tight, tight. Now this is where the magic happens. So I'm going to open up this thumb screw, insert the blade. Now I need to put my weight on this saw frame so that the saw frame bows a little bit and it tightens. So as it's bowed and I clamp this thumb screw closed, it's gonna put a lot of tension right here on the saw blade. The saw blade needs to be nice and tight because if it's loose, it's just gonna break really easily when you try and saw and it's not gonna work for you. So here I am, I'm leaning in. Can you see the, the bowing of that blade? So I'm just gonna push it in a little bit tighter. There we go, I'm leaning in and I'm tightening it up. Tight, tight, tight. Now let's see what I've got. Can you hear that? A nice plink. That's nice and tight in there. Double check so that my teeth are out and down, which they are, so we're ready to go. Now if you wanna learn more about our jeweler saw and more um, tips for using the jeweler saw, we have a great free sawing on metal class and that explains even more um, about how to use this wonderful tool. But for now, I think that's all you need to get going. Next, I'm gonna use some lubricant to lubricate this saw blade because we're gonna start off when we saw, we want this saw um, blade to just glide through that metal. And so see how I'm applying the lubricant on either side of the saw blade, not down the front. I don't wanna gum up um, my teeth of the blade. So I'm gonna set my saw aside and I'm gonna set it so it's down on its little thumb screws so that prevents that blade from snapping right there. I'm gonna set that down on the table. And I'm also gonna apply a little bit of that um, blade lubricant right here on my, on my coil as well. 
Okay, we're almost ready. We're almost ready to go. Okay, I have a piece of painter's tape here, and sometimes I use this painter's tape if my coil isn't wound as tightly as I might want it to be, but I only use it on the very bottom of my coil to try and hold everything together, or everything tightly, rather, as I'm sawing. But this coil is actually pretty darn tight, so I'm not gonna need that extra little help of the painter's tape, so I'm gonna set that aside right there. So now I've picked up my jeweler saw. Here's my bench pin. And I'm gonna place my little coil right here on the edge of my bench pin. Now, to get started, you may want to make a couple of little, just a little teeny cut in the wood of your jump of your bench pin. That little cut is gonna help stabilize this saw blade. So when I bring the coil forward to uh, start to cut it, it's gonna keep my saw blade in place and not have it walk all over. All right, so now I'm gonna begin. I have my saw blade at about a 45 degree angle. I've cut right into the wood and I'm just gonna simply saw beginning with that first ring. Now getting started sawing always seems a little bit awkward and I've done a lot of sawing and sometimes I have that issue as well. But the thing about when you're sawing, you don't wanna push the saw blade too tightly into the metal. If you push down on it, the teeth are just gonna get all bound up in the metal and it's not gonna glide smoothly. Now, while I was giving you that little tip, you can see, oh, it's almost there. There we go. I've sawed through my first ring. This first ring is usually a reject, so I'm gonna put that aside. Okay, now that I've gotten everything stabilized here, I'm actually gonna move to the center of my bench pin. It gives me a little more room to work. So I'm gonna just continue my sawing. And can you hear what the saw is sounding like? You really want to get that nice, smooth sound. And look at that. A jump ring plopped right off of that. That's awesome. We're going to keep going. Ease up on your death grip of the saw, kids. Ease up. Don't push the blade too, um, you know, with too much force into the ring. Just let the saw do its work. And if you're lucky, you'll keep sawing these and the rings will just pop off and slide down your, um, your saw blade. And they'll all gather there waiting for you to, to free them up. Now, see how this just slid a little bit too far up, so I pushed it right back on my dowel. And I'm starting and stopping a little bit so you can see this. But you'll just kind of fall into a nice rhythm. See, look at that, there goes another one. Okay kids, we've come in with a new coil, and I'm not gonna lie, I actually broke my saw blade at the end of that other coil. And you know what, it happens. So if it happens to you, just know it happens to us professionals as well. So don't you fret, just keep on going. We wanna go ahead and get this extreme close up for you so you can see what's going on here. The jump rings are still, sawing and they're still jumping down onto the saw blade. Now sometimes you have to stop and push them towards the front of your dowel. That's okay too. You'll just stop, push them, and keep on going. Well here you have it. Here are some of the jump rings that I cut with my jeweler saw. The edges should be nice and flush and clean and free of burrs because you used a nice fresh saw blade when you started this project. But if your rings do have a few burrs or you need a few more finishing tips and techniques, we're gonna jump right back to Lisa Claxton and she's gonna finish this out for you. After I've cut my rings, I want to go ahead and check each of the rings, 
just quickly to make sure that there's no rings that either have a bad cut or maybe when I was sawing I accidentally cut the bottom. If I do find a bad ring, I want to go ahead and pull it off to the side and I'm going to work on cleaning this ring up. Now when I look close at this ring, I notice that there's a cut right on the very end. It's not a flush cut and it's a little bit barbed and jagged. Now this being a copper ring, oftentimes I would just call it a lost ring and toss it out. But if I was working with sterling or any other precious metal, I would want to do my best to save this ring so I'm not wasting the metal. The first thing I want to do is try and figure out what happened. It looks like I just made a mistake on my cut here. So oftentimes I can just go in with my flush cutters and trim the end. Now if after I trim it, I find that there's a little bit of a burr on the end, I can always use needle files. And a needle file is basically just going to file the end of the ring nice and flat. So usually it just takes a couple swipes with your needle file and you'll get a nice flush end on the end of your ring. Now something to keep in mind is if you end up using your flush cutters to trim the end, you might be actually making your ring slightly smaller. You'll see I have quite a bit of a gap here and it's because I cut it with my pliers. So it's something to think about anytime you need to use your cutters to cut the ring is that you could be losing length of wire by doing that technique and therefore decreasing the size of the inside diameter of your jump ring. Now I do want to think about the way that I use my flush cutters so that I can extend the life of the tool. The strongest point of the blades on my cutter is as far in towards the hinge as I can get. So the inside of the blade is much stronger than the very tip of the blade. The particular brand of cutters that I use is pretty sturdy and I can cut 16 gauge nice and flush with the very tip. However, I know in order for my tools to last even longer, when I'm cutting, if I can cut further in the blade, it's going to last much longer so I can get several more years out of my tool rather than always cutting at the smallest point of my tool. So when I'm cutting my coils, it's something that I want to keep in mind is that I may want to try and pull them apart a little bit more so I can cut just a bit deeper in the jaws of the pliers. And this gives me a much better cut and it's much better for my tool than cutting directly on the tip. I also find I tend to get better flush cuts by cutting just a little bit further in. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this lesson. Keep in mind that there's a lot of different ways to make jump rings. The techniques that we learned today are great for smaller quantities, but should you need large quantities, several hundred or more of the exact same jump ring, you might think about other tool alternatives, including jump ring makers. There's quite a few on the market, and there's many sources in which you can buy them that will help you use power tools to cut your rings. Additionally, when you're doing your final cleanup of jump rings, you might find that the rings are a little bit too soft for the project that you're working with. You can use a tumbler and mix them with steel shot and tumble for about an hour to give you a nice hardness to your rings. It'll also help buff out any tool marks you have from using the mandrel or cutting with your cutters. I hope you've enjoyed this lesson.